Soil is a vital living ecosystem that supports plants, animals, and humans. It's teeming with billions of bacteria, fungi, and other microbes that are the foundation of a complex ecosystem. Viewing soil this way reflects a fundamental shift in the way we care for it. Welcome to the Soil Health Podcast from Minokin Farm. Hi, my name is Jay Fear, and I'm Soil Health Specialist uh, with NRCS USDA right here in Bismarck, North Dakota. And we're getting ready for our annual uh, garden tour uh, today. And we have some uh, special guests, uh, Dr. David Johnson, uh, also his wife, um, Wei, Ch Wei Chen. I almost uh, didn't get that, but um, got close enough, I hope. And uh, David is a molecular biologist, uh, research scientist, California State University at Chico, California. And it's the Center uh, for Regenerative Agriculture. So we're really excited to um, have Wei Chen and David both here together at the same time. And just to uh, kind of share in uh, their expertise, uh, especially in terms of today's topic of uh, compost. And so with that, um, David, welcome. Thank you. Wei Chen, welcome. Thank you. And uh, we just want to talk a little bit about uh, something that's kind of, uh, I, I think when they hear your names, they start to think, people start to think in terms of static compost. I don't think that's uncommon uh, because you've really shed some light um, on a different way of making compost, different way of looking at compost. Mm -hmm. And I think it also expresses a, just a complete new appreciation of it and, and what it has the capability to do in terms of life in the soil, both diversity and, and, and just the amount of life as well. So with that, I just um, maybe, uh, David, you want to start by sharing a little information on how you got started on this whole look at uh, static compost and compost in general? Well, I'd have to bring my wife in on that. She's, she's the one with the background of all of this. Uh, when I first started this project with USDA, looking at uh, what to do with dairy manure, they had a big issue with the salinity on it. And uh, the people that had it a decade before me had concluded that compost was bad for soils. And I, as I tell you, I did scoff at that a little bit and laugh, but then I looked at the data and they were right. You know, the compost that was coming out of that windrow composting process that they were using, it actually was as saline or more saline than what they started with. Well, that's an, that's a real interesting start. And so, did you did you observe anything on, like, for instance, in terms of the fungal um, uh, composition in the compost? Uh, was there any observations on it? At, at that point, uh, no. It's not until she got tired of my dirty clothes coming in <laughs> for the laundry. And she says, "We're going to do this different." And she and I worked together, and we came up with this static pile process, and the salinity reduction just was uh, a product of, of, of what we did in a static process. And yet, yes, at that point, then we did notice the fungal community was dominating in these piles. Because that's, uh, it's kind of one of the, um, I don't know if you want to call it a holy grail of soil biology or, but it's kind of one, at least here in the Northern Plains, it's the more difficult item for us to achieve is a stronger fungal community. It's, the bacteria portion of it we seem pretty good at here in the Northern Plains, but, but achieving the fungal, a, a stronger presence is, is more difficult for us. So that's, that's an encouraging thing to, to hear alone. Yeah, we, we were right with you. We have a very do bacterial dominant system in the South as, as well. And the fungi are cr critical to this process, but they're difficult to maintain with the agricultural practices that we have right now. So when you started this process, were you, were you thinking of um, reintroducing biology that you think maybe was there at one time, but now maybe not as present? Or were you just thinking of augmenting and supplementing? Or, you know, what, what was some of your thoughts on, on that early process? Well, at that part of the process, we were just considering the salinity issue. It's not until we started comparing this compost to other composts that were available in our area that we saw this increased ability in plant growth. And we thought, oh, so there's something going on here. So then from that point, we started applying it in the field. And we saw increased productivity in the field with an application of this. So it just 
one thing after another, a lot of it was serendipity. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. never what we were shooting for in the research. It was always something that was popping up on the side and, and you know, things you usually say, you say it's an anomaly. It's an outlier. But you observed it. We observed yeah. it and then we followed it. Followed and it. And I think that was the key to us ending up where we are now is that we did take a, the road less traveled yeah. in, in many yes. respects yes. And, and went with the observations. Very good. So that leads me to ask another question, and <clears throat> that would be in terms of uh, any observations that you had on carbon uh, before and after this process or during this process where there's some other additional observations on what, what was happening to carbon? Well, I was in an environmental engineering, uh, a satellite of environmental engineering at NMSU, and we were looking at also the carbon sequestration. And I thought, well, let's look and see how this, this works in the soil. But what we were finding out is, you know, it's, this is a little more than just about soil carbon. This is a, a system that we're rebuilding. It's knowing that at the front end of this that you can capture more carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's what we noticed in these fields. We were able to quintuple the amount of net primary productivity in those soils compared to what we started with. And then on the back end of this, uh, the respiration component, seeing as you improve the soil biology in these soils, the, the carbon use efficiency goes way up. When you, you almost quadruple the efficiency of those organisms using that carbon and employing it in to other microbes or more uh, car carbon structures in the soil. And it's, it's putting all these together that we see, gosh, this could be a really good answer for reducing atmospheric CO2. Uh, it could be a good answer for slowing down the acidification of the oceans on this planet. And you know, we kind of partly pursued this because we thought that a carbon market might develop. Mm -hmm. Sure. And we see, well, we had to look and say, well, how fast can we do this? You know, how much carbon can we get in and how fast can we do it? And, and how robust is this system? And just one thing, just everything started coming together as a system once we started looking at it. And so, so what I'm hearing you say as you, as you went down the road, the, uh, the systems approach was, was definitely on the table and, and made a difference on how this... It wouldn't let us alone. Yeah. <laughs> it just kept popping its head up. <laughs> We're looking for that silver bullet always, of course. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it was more robust than we had ever imagined. Was, you know, just the increase in the net primary productivity can account for almost all of the anthropogenic CO2 emissions that we have. So we've, we've so crippled these systems on, in agriculture and our rangelands that they've lost that net primary productivity. If we don't restore that, we can't do anything about soil carbon and the, on the back end as far as the respiration. Be a, be a very slow accumulation if, if any. If, if any. Yeah, right. you know, we're just, right. you, you can't, you have to have a certain amount coming into this system because you always have a certain amount leaving. respiring. It's, it's, yeah. it's a living organism. Right. The soils are, are a living organism and, and that's the key to understanding how to move forward on these systems. So, so I have to ask this too, um, bringing this concept uh, into what I would I'll refer to as uh, modern production ag, today's ag, and uh, uh, large scale, large scale ag like we would have here in the northern plains, uh, but also uh, orchards, also gardens, uh, grasslands, um, organic production, no-till production. There's we we have all of these different labels, if you will. And, and uh, what, what's your thoughts on bringing this concept in into uh, a multitude of different systems and the role it could play? Well, the, probably the easiest is rangeland. That's where we've seen such, uh, that's what we're trying to copy. We're copying what the bison did on the Great Plains. Uh, well, it started about 55 million years ago when grazers first evolved on this planet. And that's where the grasses also came along. But that, those soils were up to six feet deep with high carbon content. And it was that system of the, the grazers being held in tight herds, moved along by the predators, so they wouldn't graze very long in one area. They'd only graze probably 30 to 40% what was there. Trompel 
what grasses were there, leave their dung. The dung would be rolled up into small balls by dung beetles and put in the ground and, and basically composted in place. This, this was a huge inoculation process moving across the Great Plains, increasing the productivity of those systems to the point that you know, they could build up soil carbon. And, and with the ruminant always being a bit of an oasis, wet year, dry year, winter, summer, uh, allowed that composting process to occur as you yes. just described it. Yes. So uh, the, the ruminant obviously played a big role. I, I think they're key to the issue. And we're just trying to mimic that. And in orchards, we see people coming in with their cover crops and also grazing in these orchards or inoculating with the, this compost put that we're that he came up with so mm -hmm. uh, but that that's the two easiest yeah to me and we got to have a starting point right, right. and and cropland is it's probably gonna be a little tougher but we do see people making headway in this one, one observation uh, you know from having worked in the northern plains for a long time myself uh, something like this anytime uh, something that's not unusual in our production systems is is a liquid and so anytime you know because we're we're set up for things yeah. of that nature. So that kind of gives us another option in, in larger scale ag is uh, looking at that as an application methodology or something uh, in addition to all the other ways of doing this. But um, I, I can see some possibilities in that. Yeah, when you have the equipment already set up, you're already ahead in the game. Yeah, and then yeah. we're just running out of excuses of not to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if that's even possible. Yeah, if that's possible. <laughs> uh, and then too, uh, you know, we have to ask a little bit about, um, uh, and I think this was maybe some of your, uh, maybe they were some of your earlier videos. I, I, I'm not sure on the time frame, but uh, you had some discussion in those on application rates. Yes. So, yeah, we started out at 400 pounds per acre. It was it was kind of a shot in the dark. We didn't know what to apply. Mm -hmm. That's the amount I had left for the land area that I had. Okay. So okay, I was kind of curious how that started. <laughs> well, again, serendipity <laughs> or necessity, I guess in sure, this case. Sure. Sure. Uh, but that at that rate, you know, we had only applied once on this field, and we ran this experiment for about, well, we're still on it, looking at what was the impact and you know what is the production level, and. Uh, that uh, 400 pounds per acre at one shot did seem to restore the community to that system, the microbial community. Okay, David, maybe uh, uh, got to ask this question as well, is um, something that's um, probably discussed quite a bit um, more frequently is uh, vermicomposting as well. And so do you see um, these as separate items or do you see these uh, as a bit of a sequence or a system or, or wh where, where does your mind go on this? Uh, well, as a scientist, the jury's still out. I, I see some people using the vermicompost uh, an extract from that and, and compounded with a, uh, a regular compost in, in the air applications or in the, the production of the extract. Well, this is kind of a combination of both. This is a vermicomposting process. Uh, it's a static composting process as well. So it's, you know, this is, there's still a lot we don't know on this. So on, on your uh, composter that um uh, Wei Chen and yourself put together, uh, do you actually add uh, an earthworm population to these as well uh, when they're composting? Or Well, our first bioreactor, no, we didn't, but they found the pile. Okay. So another yeah. serendipity, and we'll take it. You know, it's yeah. uh, anything's helpful in research. But uh, from that point on, we said, okay, we'll just keep the worms in the process. And we would use this. I actually used this compost in an experiment for my uh, PhD on um, biohydrogen production. Okay. And we had used the community in this, in, a, in these uh, bioreactors. And it was interesting that, again, nature trying to tell you it's all about the microbiome and its structure. We we're able to break every law of hydrogen production in these systems. The, the, uh, the rules on biohydrogen production are a pH of about five. Uh, low headspace pressures in the bioreactor, um, mesophilic temperature or body temperature, and low hydrogen partial pressure in the system. The community that developed in these, bio, in these uh, reactors from the compost, they produced 
hydrogen down to a pH of 3. They would do it up to 45 PSI, and that's when our glass bottles, the bioreactors, blew up. They would do it at body temperature, and they could make hydrogen at 100% hydrogen partial pressure. Okay. My wife straightened me out it, at room temperature instead of body temperature. So sure. they, they broke every rule of hydrogen production. And, uh, and they were uh, one of the first that was actually an energy positive system. So it's with the right microbial community, it seems like almost anything can happen on this planet. Very, very, very again, very interesting and, and uh, lots of observations involved in it. Uh, so you're going to be uh, uh, presenting some information today at the Minokan farm. And uh, if you had to summarize um, that information into something a bit shorter right now, what's, what's, uh, what are we going to be hearing from David Johnson? What's, what's going to happen in that hour? It's all about the biology. Very good. That is, and this is a living organism that we're dealing with. And it won't be easy understanding it. Uh, we have trouble understanding each other as well. So sure. it's going to be the same difficulty understanding the soil systems because they're variable. And nature has the, seems to have the ability to self-assemble these systems. It's just that we have to know when to step away. And that's quite often. <laughs> and we have trouble re resisting tweaking something. Yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah, very good. Well, we really appreciate uh, your willingness to uh, complete a podcast with us today. And again, appreciate having both of you here to uh, do the program today and, and uh, just share information with our group. And I, I think it's going to be a fascinating day. So well, thank you for the opportunity to share this. Uh, Wei Chen and I both are quite amazed to come up here and, and be able to present this. Well, thank you very much. Very good. The Soil Health Podcast is a production of the Minokin Farm. Minokin Farm exists to foster natural resource education and systems approach conservation. This 150-acre demonstration farm, located just east of Bismarck, North Dakota, was established in 2009 and draws people from all over the world. The farm is owned and operated by Burley County Soil Conservation District, which has an office in Bismarck, North Dakota. Additional financial and technical support is provided by the North Dakota Department of Health, Water Quality Division, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture.